Well, hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about two very, very common things that come up on your exam and certainly also common in clinical practice, and that's diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Um, now, one of these tend to be asymptomatic. The other one is pretty severely symptomatic. So um, there are some differences here, and you will be expected to be able to differentiate the two. Fortunately, it is not that difficult. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get updates and notifications as I put more and more videos up. So we're talking about diverticular diseases here, and um, the next couple videos that I'm going to be putting out are going to be on constipation and malignancies, colon cancer and surveillance. Okay, diverticulosis. This is an outpouching of the colonic mucosa and submucosa. So what that means is that this is a false diverticulum. Okay, so along the same lines as um, like a Zenker's diverticulum, uh, however, not along the same lines as a Meckel diverticulum, which is actually a true diverticulum. Diverticulosis is uh, when it does bleed, and usually when it does bleed, it's in the context of diverticulitis. Uh, it is the most common cause of acute lower GI bleed in adults over the age of 40. It is very prevalent, I should say, uh, in countries with Western diets. So low fiber, high fat diets, processed foods that strip away all the fiber from what you're eating. Um, it causes a decrease in stooling. I mean, you're not going to be pooping as much. Um, that is a huge problem. And it's going to cause straining and it's going to increase the interluminal pressure. The whole pathophysiology behind it. Now, I worked under a physician uh, who's a gastroenterologist who's from India, and he said, in India, I don't see this. <laughs> in the U.S., I see it all the time. I know I have a lot of viewers from all around the world, so if you are from India or that area, please let me know how often you see this because I want to know if he was telling me the truth. It's generally asymptomatic. They may have left lower quadrant pain, which you're never going to see is fever or systemic signs. That points to diverticulitis. Um, often where you'll diagnose this is when a patient comes in for their routine surveillance colonoscopy and you'll see these little holes and they're not actually holes. They're like little caves in the, uh, in the intestinal wall. Um, so it's something that's pretty commonly seen. It's something you'll want to take note of, but there's nothing that we do about it. So it's just observation, educate them about increasing fiber in their diet. Nine in 10 Americans are deficient in fiber. We want 20 to 25 grams of dietary fiber per day. That, that's difficult to do, by the way. The major complication is diverticulitis. So this is diverticulosis here. I'm going to change my pen color to red. Um, what it looks like uh, on CT is sort of these little bubbles. Okay, that's how it looks. Now, on the other hand, if you were to do an x-ray with barium, so you could do either barium x-ray or barium enema, or you could do a water-soluble contrast uh, enema. Then if you do an x-ray, you'll be able to see uh, the ticks. Now, this is a very, obviously a very severe case. And um, you can see it's all the way from the sigmoid to the descending colon, and you even see some here at the hepatic flexure. So this is a very severe case. Usually they'll be kind of restricted down there. Diverticulitis is, um, that should say, man, I really need to proofread these. <laughs> At least I noticed them. So diverticulitis is an infection of a diverticulum, and usually it's due to a fecal lift. What does that sound like? Appendicitis. Okay, remember appendicitis is caused by a fecal lift, and then everything behind it gets backed up and infected? Same thing here. So you have your little tick. And you have a fecal lift here. We'll just put lift. Well, all this stuff here is going to be sitting and you're going to get an infection. That's a general principle of pathology. When you've got a blockage, let's say it's a blockage from a gallstone in the gallbladder or um, a um, blockage by a fecal lift at the appendix, you will get an infection eventually. 
So the best initial diagnostic step here is an abdominal CT with IV contrast. Do not, do not, do not do a colonoscopy or any kind of enema on these patients because you may perforate or you may get all that enema fluid. Uh, if it does, if it is perforated, that may get into the peritoneum and uh, cause a really awful chemical peritonitis. You do not want to do that. So stick with an abdominal CT with IV contrast. Because this is left lower quadrant pain, these patients tend to be septic. You want to get a urinalysis, checking for urosepsis and blood cultures as well. The treatment. Okay, so the question is, I've got this patient with diverticulitis. How do they look? If they look fine, they don't look septic, maybe a low-grade fever, otherwise generally okay, generally healthy, we can send them off outpatient. We give them amoxicillin clavulanate augmentin orally, and then we tell them to really rest your bowel, stick to a clear liquid diet, jello, juices, and stuff like that are fine, um, and then slowly advance your diet uh, as your symptoms improve. If they are older, they're in such severe pain that they need uh, pain relief like morphine, if they're institutionalized, uh, if we can't rely on them to take their medications, then we admit them and we give them IV antibiotics, and that would be metronidazole and ciprofloxacin. Now, there are other regimens, just like anything in infectious disease. There's tons of regimens you can use. This is the one that probably comes up most often. Traditionally, we use metronidazole and afloroquinolone. Um, but there are other drugs that you can use. You can use uh, piperacillin tazobactam. I believe you can use muropenem. Um, but this is kind of the standard. We also want to place an NG tube and bowel rest. So um, you can either, uh, usually because these patients may be going off to surgery, you want to have them NPO. Um, so start your you know, D5 half normal saline, get uh, PTPTT, get your... Uh, blood type and cross match, and, um, and you should be good to go. Your surgeon will appreciate it. Your anesthesiologist will appreciate it if they're NPO. Uh, you also want to inform these patients, again, increase fiber intake once you send them home. If there is a perforation, straight off to surgery.